On the, the trip that, um, that led to the first Lonely Planet guidebook, in 1980, I was in the town of Surat, and I was using a book called Murray's Handbook to India, a book which was sort of was a century old, really, very much out of date, because um, at that time there weren't, there was, everyone was waiting for our guidebook to India. And it was there where I first heard about Thomas Coriat, and I quote from that wonderful old book, Thomas Coriat, who tramped on foot from London to India, limiting his expenses to tuppence a day, which he procured by begging. From the Mughal court at Ajmer, he walked to Surat, where he arrived desperately ill with dysentery and died in December 1617. From those couple of sentences, Coriat and his long walk to India and sad forgotten end has intrigued me ever since. In recent years, there have actually been several books written about him, and this year I've spent a little time tracking him down. When Coriat made that long walk to India, it took him several years, he essentially traveled for one of three reasons, profit, conquest, or religion. Tourism didn't come into it. So in a way, Thomas Coriat helped to invent tourism, the idea of traveling somewhere simply because you wanted to see and experience places, not because you were going to make money out of them, convert people, or conquer them. I think in a way, he was the first English tourist to India. Well, earlier this year, I went to Odcombe in Somerset, and there I am, standing in front of the church, it's about 200 kilometers west of London, um, the church of St. Peter and St. Paul, where George Coriat, his father, was the rector of the church. Thomas was born in Odcombe about 1577 to 1579, no one's really sure. He was educated at Winchester College, then he went to Gloucester College, which is now part of Worcester College, which is what you see there, at Oxford, and he was noted as a fine linguist, but he never actually graduated. A lot of people went to university in those days and didn't actually come out with a degree. Now, a few miles from Odecombe is Montacute, the stately home of the local aristocrat of the time, Sir Edward Phillips. And Phillips probably introduced Coriat to the court of, King Hen of Prince Henry, the eldest son of James I. And it appears that Coriat sort of joined his court sometime around 1603. Although he never had any clearly defined role, he was something of a court jester. So we might have classified him as an after-dinner speaker or a stand-up comedian these days. I like to think of him as one of that gang in the TV series Entourage. Anybody seen that? He was one of them. He sort of hung out with them and made jokes. And Bishop Fuller commented that Prince Henry allowed him a pension and kept him for his servant. Sweet meats and coriat made up the last course on all court entertainments. Now, he always seemed to be eager for respect. He, he, he thought he was a pretty intelligent person, but he wasn't wealthy, he wasn't part of the nobility, and it seems he was treated like a bit of a joke. He was described as a combative, bombastic, scruffy, garrulous figure, the scatterbrain among the smoothies of the, Jac of the Jacobean court. In 1608, Mr. Coriat decided to visit Europe. And this was about 50 years before the, the Grand Tour, which became the finishing score for any well-bred and wealthy young man, and Coriat was certainly not wealthy. He set off in May, and over the next five months, he traveled through France and Italy to Venice. There we are in Venice. And he returned via Switzerland, Germany, and Netherlands. He covered almost the entire distance on foot. During that time, he walked around 2,500 kilometers. Back in Oudcombe, he sat down and he wrote a 645-page long book about his travels. It was published in 1611 and it was titled Coriat's Crudités, which seems a rather strange title, but of course the word comes from the French, the title comes from the French word, still used today for raw vegetables. And that was what he attempted to do. He tried to put down his raw impressions of the places he'd seen. He was emphasizing that this wasn't a scholarly book or a historical report. He was, he was in a way inventing the travel book. And that was a problem because people had no idea what a travel book was. They'd never seen one. And he, the book was a, a considerable success, but it didn't give him respect. And it was respect that Mr. Coriat really wanted. I had to underline that word. Today, the book's in a, a wonderful record of the countries he traveled through at the time. He was very attentive. He was very interested in what he saw. Let me show that with two paragraphs from the book, both of discoveries he made in Italy. And many of them do carry other fine things of a far greater price that will cost at least a ducat, which they commonly call, in the Italian tongue, umbrellas. That is, things which minister shadow to shelter them against the scorching heat of the sun. Yes, Mr. Coriat had discovered the umbrella. Not an English invention to keep the rain off, but an Italian one to keep the sun away. This is the first description of the umbrella in English. He continued, 
These are made of leather, sometimes answerable to the form of a little canopy, rather like this, um, hooped in the inside with diverse little wooden hoops that extend the umbrella and a pretty large compass. They impart so large a shadow unto them that it keepeth the heat of the sun from the upper part of their bodies. Those inventive Italians. Today they turn out Ferrari cars, Armani suits, and Alessi kettles, but they were hard at it 400 years ago. Corriad also brought back news of another clever Italian, Italian device. I observed a custom in all those Italian cities and towns through which I passed that is not used in any other country that I saw in my travels. Neither do I think that any other native of Christendom does use it, but only Italians. The Italians, always at their meals, use a little fork. Now, Mr. he brought back the fork to England. He continued, the reason of this curiosity is because the Italians cannot endure by any means to have his dish touched by fingers, seeing that all men's fingers are not alike clean. Hereupon, I thought myself to imitate the Italian fashion by this fork, not only while I was in, it in Italy, but also in Germany, and oftentimes in England since I came home. Actually, everyone thought he was a bit of a fusspot bringing the forks around, but within a hundred years, everybody was using them. In fact, Bill Bryson, in his new book, Home, mentions Thomas Coriat's bringing the fork back to the English house. If you want to read about Coriat's European travels, there's a very funny book about it by Tim Moore. Tim Moore decided he would try to follow Coriat's route, but not on foot, but in the sort of tra transport that Mr. Coriat would have liked if he could have afforded it, and if they'd been around in those days. He thought a Rolls-Royce was the right thing. So Tim bought this very beat-up old Rolls-Royce, and Tim, rather like Tom, Thomas Coriat, had no money at all, and uh, wrote this very funny book of trying to drive to Venice and back in a Rolls-Royce that kept on breaking down, and he didn't have enough money to repair it, and he ended up sleeping in the back seat half the time. So Continental Drifter, which is a, a book about... Coriat's European travels. Well, Thomas Coriat settled back in Oakham to write his book. It's a fine little Somerset village. There's a thatched roof pub there today. I had lunch when I was there. There's a street just across from the church called Coriat Close. And for nearly a century after his European travels, Mr. Coriat's shoes hung on the walls of the church. They disappeared in 1702. The cover of the book shows his intention of donating his whole tattered traveling ensemble to the church. The, um, in the year 2000, they made a stone replica of the shoes, and that's actually the, the stone replica of Coriat's shoes on the wall of the church today. But Coriat had developed a bad case of itchy feet, and he decided to follow up his European travelers, travels with a much bigger trip and with a bigger book. At this time, he was part of the Friday Club, which met once a month at the Mermaid Tavern in London. Ben Johnson and John Donne were also part of this circle, and it's romantically suggested that William Shakespeare used to drop in, sink a beer, and have a chat with them. The tavern was only a stone's throw from St. Paul's Cathedral, though St. Paul's didn't exist at that time. It was actually on the junction of Friday Street and Bread Street. There's no trace of it at all today, not even a plaque or a sign. It was destroyed during the Great Fire of London in 1666. Anyway, in 1612, Mr. Coriat set off to India. He first of all took a boat for Istanbul, or Constantinople as it was known at that time. They evaded the Dunkirk pirates in the Channel and the Barbary raiders along the north coast of Africa, but it was still a long journey. He stopped at Zakthanos, southernmost of the Ionian Islands, where he commended the excellent strong wines. But he noted with horror that women rode donkeys astride rather than sitting side saddle, something that he had never read or heard of amongst any other women. He made a stop at what he thought was the site of actually there's Istanbul where he was heading to. He made a stop at what he thought was the site of Troy, but it wasn't. And it, even back then, it wouldn't have had this big wooden horse, which is actually a, quite a modern invention for modern tourists going to Troy. But he arrived in Constantinople in 1613, and he hung around for 10 months. This was the era that you could turn up and expect to get the spare bedroom. There we are. That's, that's Istanbul, the, um, the Bosphorus, and the bridges across the Golden Horn there. Anyway, he, um, that time you could turn up and expect to get the spare bedroom at the embassy, which of course you can't do anymore. And that's exactly what he did. He stayed with the ambassador to, um, to the Ottoman court for 10 months. 
And if we date the empire's peak from 16, 1563 and the start of its decline from 1683, then it was at its peak for his visit. Unfortunately, much of his no doubt minute reports of the city and that society have been lost. A contemporary visitor reported the Sultan would summon his choice from his harem to his bed and in the morning send her a present in proportion to the satisfaction and content which he had received from her that night. He went on to say, sadly, that there were so many women in the palace that despite the Sultan's best efforts, they were wasting their youthful days among themselves in evil thoughts. And as a result, cucumbers were sent unto them sliced to deprive them of the means of playing the wanton for they all being young, lusty, and lascivious wenches, and wanting the society of men, are doubtless possessed of unchaste thoughts. <laughs> Coriad did manage to um, catch a whirling dervish performance. Um, he complained about the singing, a Jewish circumcision. He was singularly unimpressed by Jewish religious ceremonies, a fireworks display which did impress him, and the triumphal entry into the city of the Grand Sultan a spectacle that I never saw the like of in my life. He also noted assorted strange creatures, including a pelican, the strangest bird that ever I saw in my life. Anyway, he sailed out of Constantinople, stopping like any Australian backpacker would do in Gallipoli, and then in Lesbos. This, of course, is the island where the word lesbian derives, and another contemporary of Constantinople had noted the unnatural and filthy lusts committed daily in the bathhouses of Constantinople, Yea, women with women, a thing incredible. <laughs> Coriad noted that the women of Lesbos were the ugliest sluts that I ever saw. <laughs> Saving only the Armenian trolls of Constantinople. <laughs> he was not a politically correct travel writer. <laughs> well, look, I, I stopped in Lesbos in 1972 on my way to India. Um, from there, Coriat went to Iskenderun. That's me in 1972. Um, on the Turkish coast near Cyprus, which also failed to impress him. But then he traveled inland to Aleppo, which was much more to his taste in Syria. Christians were allowed to ride horses there, and I remember Aleppo for its wonderful old American cars. I always find it curious that places with the worst relations with the US, like Cuba and Syria, also tend to be the places with the greatest affection for American cars. That's the, the bonnet of a Chevrolet, mid-50s, which I saw in Aleppo. Coriat set off from Aleppo in a caravan and stopped in Damascus before making a pilgrimage around assorted Christian sites in the Holy Land, including the Virgin Mary's house in Nazareth. Another contemporary English visitor lamented that he'd been taken in by what he was told was her house in Loreto in Italy, where it had been flown from Palestine by four angels. This was a devilish invention, he raged, to deceive the blindfolded people and fill the coffers of the Roman priests, all part of the bottomless gulf of papistry. Travel writing in those days really did get the, get the fork in, didn't it? Anyway, he arrived in Jerusalem, and although other visitors had plenty of complaints about the treatment of Christian tourists, Coriat seemed to enjoy himself and did all the, the currently touristy things. He had a cross tattooed on his arm, so artfully as if they had been drawn by some accurate pencil upon parchment. From there, he continued back to Aleppo and joined a large caravan heading east. He soon crossed the Euphrates and entered Mesopotamia. He stopped at Diyarbakir in eastern Turkey, and he was mugged in the town. He reported that he lost both his gold and silver, but not all by reasons of certain clandestine corners where it was placed. He must have had a money belt back then. 400 years later, our Turkey guide still warns about thefts in the town of Diyarbakir. Now, I flew there from Istanbul in 2006. This is the view of the city, for, city wall from my hotel. Um, when I was there, I walked out to the taxi queue, and I said, I want to go to Iraq. And this is the gentleman who drove me to the, um, the border of Iraq, and I walked over and spent two weeks in Iraq in 2006. Continuing east, um, Coriat crossed the Tigris, found it so shallow that it reached no, no higher than the calf of my leg, for I waded over it a foot. He had a dim glimpse, a distant glimpse, of Mount Ararat, and so did I when I drove my car to India in 72. Mount Ararat in the background, of course, that's where Noah is said to have landed his ark. He arrived in Isfahan, where he had to wait another two months for another caravan. I was there most recently in 2004, and the great Iman Square behind me in this photograph wouldn't have looked very different when Coriat paid his visit. While he was in Isfahan, he prepared a large collection of his notes and left them there to be transported back to Aleppo and on to England, but there's no trace of what happened to them. Although one reference I've read noted that in 1619, the English factory in Isfahan had 
certain books that had ended up there by the death of some of them that could not carry them to heaven. So perhaps his long lost account of his great walk east is sitting in some mosque storeroom in Isfahan to this day. This is the wonderful Shah Mosque at one end of the square. I took that photograph in 2004. In 1615, Coriat joined another large caravan, 2,000 camels, 1,500 horses, over 1,000 mules, 800 asses, 6,000 people, and departed Isfahan. It's unclear what route he took from Isfahan to the east through Afghanistan. He went that way, we know that. What is known that he had a quite astonishing coincidental meeting in the desert. They encountered another caravan coming in the opposite direction. And this caravan featured eight elephants, sorry, eight antelopes and two elephants. They were the first elephants Coriat had ever seen. And they were on their way as presents to Shah Abbas back in Persia. They were brought by this remarkable couple, Sir Robert Shirley and his glamorous Circassian wife, Teresia. Note that she's holding a gun in her hand. On two occasions, she's said to have saved her husband's life by shooting bandits or robbers or someone who were trying to hold them up. They're dressed in Persian fashion because he'd been appointed the Shah's ambassador to England. And the Shirleys had traveled, they'd been to Persia, they'd gone back to England, they'd gone around the Cape of Good Horn to India, they'd bought eight antelopes and two elephants to take back to Iran to give away as presents, and they were on their way to Isfahan. Coriat noted, they seemed to exult for joy to see me. But what is truly remarkable is that Shirley then reached into his baggage and did show me, to my singular contentment, both my books neatly kept. He had Coriat's books in his bags. He was bringing them along as travel reading. Presumably then asked Coriat if he'd mind autographing them. Coriat noted that Shirley had promised to put a good word in for him with Shah Abbas, which he hoped to be useful on his return from India. But Theresia Shirley clearly had a clearer vision of Coriat's situation. She advanced him 40 shillings in Persian money, because he was desperately short of cash. He spent two weeks in Kandahar in Afghanistan. Now, I traveled through Kandahar in 72, but although I traveled widely in Afghanistan four years ago, I didn't visit Kandahar. It's probably the most dangerous and difficult part of Afghanistan today. Anyway, from there he descended down to the Indus River, which he reported was a, as broad again as our Thames in London. There was another stop in Multan in the Punjab, where Coriat was lucky to escape unscathed. I've read one modern description of him as a traveling Ian Paisley. And he did indeed have very little respect for other religions. He'd learned Italian during his lengthy stay in Constantinople. And one day, one day he got into an argument with an Italian-speaking Muslim who called him an infidel. This so enraged Coriat that he proceeded to deliver an almighty anti-Islamic rant. I pronounced the speech before a hundred people, whereof none understood it but himself, the Italian-speaking Muslim. So he would have got away with it, except the gentleman decided he'd now translate it into, um, into Urdu for the, for the onlookers. But remarkably, said Coriat, nobody took offense, and he noted that if I'd spoken this, thus much in Turkey or Persia against Muhammad, they would have roasted me upon a spit. <laughs> On he went to Lahore, which he declared one of the largest cities of the whole universe. It exceedeth Constantinople itself in greatness. And then he carried on to Agra across such a delicate and even tract of ground as I never saw before. This, of course, would have become the Grand Trunk Road, which Kipling would celebrate. 1972, my wife Maureen and I arrived at the Taj in Agra on our first wedding anniversary, from which you can calculate that we had our 39th wedding anniversary last month, or earlier this month. Now, I've been back to Agra many times. as a Richard Ianson photograph of looking across to the Taj. Um, but it, he wouldn't have seen it because the, the Taj wasn't built then. He didn't, they didn't start construction of the Taj until 17 years after um, Thomas Coriat was there, and it wasn't completed until 1653. Now, Coriat thought he would find the great mogul Jahangir's court in Agra, but he'd found it shifted to Ajmer, a further 10 days' walk away, which meant he had to cover 30 kilometers a day on the next stretch, and he arrived there in the middle of 1615. From Ajmer, in a letter to his mother, he described the caravans which had carried him across Asia. It's a word much used in all Asia, by which is understood a great multitude of people traveling together upon the way with camels, horses, mules, asses, etc., on which they carry merchandise from one country to another, and tents and pavilions under which, instead of houses, they shelter themselves in open fields. In another letter to a friend, he said he walked about 2,700 English miles, which is probably an underestimate, not only had he walked a lot, he'd also been remarkably economical. He boasted in another letter to his mother, I spent in my 10 months travel between Aleppo and the Mughal court 
but three pounds sterling, victuals so, being so cheap in some countries where I traveled that I oftentimes lived competently for a penny sterling a day. In fact, he continued, since he'd had 10 shillings st stolen by certain lewd Christians of the Armenian nation, in fact, he'd only spent 50 shillings. This guy was definitely a backpacker, boasting about how cheap he got by. The East India Company in Ajma took him in and gave him free board and lodging for over a year, so he was able to report that he was not spending one little piece of money, either for diet, washing, or any other things. The letters and notes he sent back to India from here were published in 1617, showing him astride an elephant and in full European dress, although in fact he usually dressed in local attire. That's Coriat on one side, and there's me astride an elephant on the other side. Still a popular thing for tourists to do in India. Sit on an elephant and have your photograph taken. That was actually back in 1979. He was also delighted to hear that Sir Thomas Rowe had arrived at the port of Surat to manage the East India Company's operations, because Coriat had met Rowe ten years earlier. This painting shows Rowe presenting his credentials to the Mughal Emperor Jahangir. But Rowe was not in a good mood. He'd been ill. He noted the houses were all made of mud and were not so great as a cottage on Hounslow Heath. And even though he was so worn out that he described himself as scarce a crow's dinner, he was still subjected on arrival to one of Coriat's famous and presumably lengthy orations. Rowe re wrote of his meeting with Coriat that he now lives in my house. He came hither afoot having passed by Constantinople, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Damascus, and through all the Turks' territories, seen every post and pillar, observed every tomb, visited the monuments of Troy, Persia, and this king's dominion, all afoot with the most unwearied legs. His notes are already too great for portraiture, some left at Isfahan, some, some at Aleppo. Essentially, he was concluding with the note that Coriat tended to talk and write an awful lot. Now, Roe was here to convince Jahangir, and there's Jahangir, various portraits of him, to trade with England, but Coriat wanted to get to Jahangir as well, and for much more mundane purposes. He was broke, and he was after money to finance the rest of his travels. So dressed in local attire, Coriat managed to get in on one of his regular audiences and delivered another of his orations, but this time in, in Persian. He'd learned Persian, and he kicked off by addressing Jahangir as the Lord Protector of the World, went on to describe himself as a poor traveler and world seerer, Sia, continued that he'd come all the way to India, first and foremost to see the blessed face of your majesty, whose wonderful fame hath resounded all over Europe, but second because he wanted to see elephants, and third because he wanted to see the Ganges, just like any other tourist, and fourthly because he wanted to go to Samarkand and he wanted Jahangir's help in getting there. Jahangir responded he had no relations with Tartary and warned Coriat they didn't like Christians and would certainly kill him if he went there. Of course, Coriat was after cash, as well as an introduction. Unfortunately, Jahangir concluded his discourse with me by a sum of money that he threw down from a window, a hundred pieces of silver, each worth two shillings sterling, which countervailed 10 pounds of our English money. But it seems he could have done better. A good deal of the information about Coriat at this time comes from his friendship with Edward Terry. Terry had come to India as the chaplain for the East India Company, but when Sir Thomas Rowe's chaplain died, he became Rowe's personal chaplain, and Rowe said, to save me from, being, from having the life of an atheist. Terry reported that Jahangir had decided that Coriat was some kind of strange pilgrim, and since he believed he didn't care much for money, gave him not a more plentiful reward. Terry's book, A Voyage to East India, has a great deal of information about East India and also about Coriat. Coriat may have, may have made 10 quid from his speech to Jahangir, but Sir Thomas Rowe was furious. And he scolded Coriat, that's Sir Thomas Rowe, that it was discreditable for an Englishman to behave in that beggarly and poor fashion for the king, simply to crave money of him. To which Coriat essentially told Rowe that he damn well had to because never had I need, had more need of money in all my life than at that time, for in truth I had but 20 shillings sterling left in my purse. He then went off on a two-day journey to visit a certain noble and generous Christian of the Armenian race again, delivered another oration in Persian and came away with another two quid. Coriat definitely had a way with the words, and not only in Persian. Terry, there he is again, reported that he also had a great mastery of the Indistan or more vulgar language, and he reports there was a woman, a laundress, belonging to my Lord Ambassador's house, who had such a freedom and liberty of speech that she would sometimes scold, brawl, and rant from sunrising to sunset. One day, he, Coriat, undertook her in her own language, and by eight, of by eight of the clock in the morning, he had so silenced her that she had not one word more, she had not one more word to speak. <laughs> Roe had plenty to complain about as well. There were fires in the dry season, rain in the monsoon, 
Thus we were every way afflicted with fire, smokes, floods, storm, heat, dust, flies, and no temperate or quiet season. Just like India today. In late 1616, Coriat departed for Agra, having scored from Moreau, no doubt glad to get rid of him, more money. When he got to Agra, he reckoned he had about 12 pounds sterling, which he calculated would, calculated would cover another three years of travel. Unfortunately, his descriptions of Agra on this visit have all disappeared. Although he reported he planned to continue to Haridwar to see the gentle people of this country bathe in the Ganges and sacrifice a world of gold to the same river and doing other strange ceremonies most worthy of the observation. Although having described them as gentle people, his Christian prejudices then kicked in, and he described, it, he described these, strange cer these strange ceremonies as superstition and impiety, most abominable in the highest degree of these brutish ethnics that are alien from Christ and the Commonwealth of Israel. Despite their sometimes edgy relationship, it's clear that Sir Thomas Rowe understood Coriat's knowledge of India. If you look at this map of the Mughal Empire, you can see the tree-lined road from Lahore through Delhi to Agra, which impressed Coriat so much, and at Hardwar, the rock shaped like a cow head from which the Ganges pours, up in the top corner there. Both those things on that map from Coriat's notes. From there, Coriat traveled to Mandu, where Sir Thomas Rowe had relocated. Rowe arrived weary and poor health and sent a, sent a message to Coriat, asking whether his plans were for England or to stay. Well, Coriat decided to rejoin Rowe's party and travel to Mandu. It's here where he met Edward Terry and shared a room with him for the next two, two or three months. Coriat had reported that he was very healthy, but not everybody was so healthy. Coriat wrote, Terry wrote, that death made many breaches into my Lord Ambassador's family. For of four and twenty, not above the fourth man returned home. And he himself, by which he meant Sir Thomas Rowe, by violent fluxes was twice brought even to the brink of the grave. Flux was the term of the time for diarrhea. So Delhi Belly was clearly a consideration in those days. But it wasn't the only danger. Sir Thomas Rowe wrote of a lion threatening their courtyard and reported that the lion nightly put us in alarm, fetching away sheep and goats out of my court and leaping a high wall with them. I went to ask leave to kill it, for that no man may meddle with lions but the king, and it was granted. But when Rowe came out to shoot the lion, his favorite little dog raced out to confront the lion and was eaten for its troubles. Terry wrote a fine description of Coriat at the time. He was a man of very coveting eye that could never be satisfied with seeing, though he had seen very much. And I am persuaded that he took as much content in seeing as many others in the enjoying of great and rare things. He was a man that had the mastery of many hard languages, but his knowledge and high attainments in several languages made him not a little ignorant of himself, he being so covetous, so ambitious of praise, that he would hear and endure more of it than could in any measure deserve, being like a ship that hath too much sail and too little ballast. In October, Jahangir decided to move on, and Sir Thomas Rowe reluctantly had to follow. He complained that he was very weak and not likely to recover with this cold, raw, muddy water. By this time, Coriat wasn't well either, and he told Terry of his fears that he might die without his feats being known, that he might be buried in obscurity. So he decided to leave Roe and his entourage, and he made for Surat, probably with, the, probably with the intention of trying to get a ship back to England. Because at that time, Surat was the main British port on the east coast of India, west coast of India, sorry, before Bombay became the center of the East India Company. At this point, a Richard Steele turned up, bringing pearls which Sir Thomas Rowe intended to present to Jahangir. Coriat had met Steele on his way back to England, possibly at the same time he met Sir Robert Shirley. On his return to England, Steele had met King James and reported his encounter with Coriat, and he now reported the king had said, is that fool yet living? This news greatly depressed poor Coriat, the realization that the king spake no more nor better of him, saying that kings would speak of poor men what they pleased. He was even more upset when Roe gave, a letter, gave him a letter to carry to the consul in Aleppo if he traveled that way, instructing him to give Coriat 10 pounds because you shall find him an honest poor wretch. Coriat, so focused on respect and praise, was very distressed at being dismissed as a mere poor wretch. He may have been annoyed that Coriat opened the letter, Roe may have been annoyed, but he rewrote it, although Terry noted of Coriat that anything that did in any measure eclipse him in those high conceivings of his own worth did too much trouble him. Anyway, he left Roe and he set off for Surat, alone and on foot, and with 500 kilometers to travel. It's a picture he had done of Mr. Coriat walking around India. <laughs>
Surat had an impressive castle built in 1540, and there it is earlier this year. And the English factory was one of the best sort in town, very fair and strongly built. The roofs in general flat and terraced aloft so that no rain can harm it. The personnel number 26 persons English. So Coriat shambled into Surat, where, Terry reported, drinking sherry, or sack as it was known, increased his diarrhea, or flux as Terry called it, which he had then upon him. And this caused him, within a few days, after his very tedious and troublesome travels, for he went most on foot, at this place to come to his journey's end. For here he overtook death. Death is capitalized in this account, in the month of December 1617. So that was, sadly, the end of Mr. Coriat. Well, on my visit to Surat back in 1980, I didn't make any real effort to track down the sad conclusion to his travels. But I was in Bombay earlier this year, Mumbai, launching the Italian, the Italian, the Indian edition of the Lonely Planet magazine. Lonely Planet magazine on sale, the launch issue in the streets of Bombay. Of course, it was done with real Bollywood glamour. There's Maureen and I with a couple of Bollywood stars in um, the launch of the Lonely Planet magazine in Mumbai. Anyway, I took a day off and I took the train up to Surat to track down Kuryat's last days. A couple of editions ago, our guidebook to India described Surat as a place of little interest to travelers, except those with a fascination for urban decay, mayhem, noise, and pollution. It hasn't changed much since that description. I found a hotel near the railway station. That's the main train station of Surat. And the next day, I visited the site of the English factory, the one that Coriat, where Coriat had died. Today, it's the site of the Irish Presbyterian Mission. This illustration of the English factory was made in 1719, so about 100 years after Coriat died there. And today, this is the oldest building remaining on the site. Perhaps it was the building where Thomas Coriat died. It was certainly somewhere very nearby, if not here. Until Bombay took over in 1689, Surat was the headquarters for the English in India. And the factory stood just a little bit upriver from Surat Castle. But where was Coriat buried? Surat has a magnificent, though completely neglected, English cemetery with great tombs dating from the period before the East India Company shifted operations to Bombay. When I visited Surat, the cemetery was closed and locked up, but I soon discovered this impromptu cricket match going on in the cemetery grounds. So I climbed over the walls at the same place that those cricket players had climbed in, and I inspected the tombs, like this double one of George, Christopher Oxenden and Sir George Oxenden, who was head of the East India Company at that time. But European burials didn't take place here until the mid-1640s, well after Coriat's death. But in 1627, just 10 years after he died, a visiting Englishman noted in his journal that a Persian nobleman had committed suicide aboard the ship and a few days later had been entombed in Surat, not a stone's throw from Tom Coriat's grave, known by two small stones that speak his name. This modest grave was still visible nearly 50 years later when a visiting travel writer stated that he saw the Persian grave not far from that of Thomas Coriat, our English fakir as they name him, together with an Armenian Christian known by their graves lying east and west. So that would mean Coriat was buried close to where the English cemetery would later be, but on the other side of the road. And since Coriat was buried near Armenian graves, it's interesting in the Dutch cemetery there are some Armenian graves you can still find to this day. It's a couple of the Armenian graves there. But there's another possibility for his last resting place. In his last year, Coriat spent a lot of time with Edward Terry, and Terry insists that Coriat was buried outside Surat at Swally, the ancient port of the town, about 20 kilometers to the west. And there is Swally on um, Google Earth. In 1619, Terry said he saw Coriat's grave amongst many more English graves that, that lie there interred. Terry described it as like one of those that are usually made in our churchyards. Well, I, just, I managed to make my way to Swally looking for Thomas Coriat's grave. There's no trace of a grave to there, there today or any other European graves. But there is, where I mark it as India TC's tomb, a, Mohammedan, a, a monument, a Mughal tomb, a monument in Mohammedan style, according to an old guidebook, standing at the top of a small hill just outside the village of Rajgiri. It was a coastal landmark, and a British Admiralty chart of 1837 showed it as Tom Coriat's tomb. Now, it's highly unlikely that a penniless traveler, a backpacker, four centuries ahead of backpacking, who sadly died far from home and friends, would be honored with such a tomb. But it's a nice idea that this might be it. This could be the final resting place of a quite remarkable traveler.
So I was very pleased when I managed to find my way to that small village, track down this unmarked and quite forgotten memorial. I'm happy to think of it as Tom Curriette's tomb, and I'm pleased, I'm pleased that I've managed to track him from cradle to grave. Thank you very much.